Good evening and welcome to this edition of De Facto Review with Jagal De Facto and myself, Aruna, bringing you a weekly edition of the news and current affairs that shape Mongolia. We are live on Facebook at V Television. You can also join us at Twitter, um, hashtag Jagal De Facto. Coming up on the program. Shanghai Cooperation Organization and President of Mongolia. Should there be a constitutional court in Mongolia? National budget deficit after Asia-Europe meeting in 2016. First topic of the night, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the President of Mongolia. In 1996, five countries founded an organization called the Shanghai Five Process to discuss security as well as economic and political stability in Eurasia. They were Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and China. Today this organization is also known as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and has eight members including Uzbekistan and most recently India and Pakistan. Since 2004, Mongolia is an observer state at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and um, during the economic forum recently, the president of Mongolia, Mr. Batola, expressed his interest in Mongolia becoming a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Some policy, international policy analysts and experts say that it is better for Mongolia to remain an observing member instead of a full member. Um, so the question is, what, what is your position on this uh, issue and do you think it is better for Mongolia to remain an observing state rather than a full member? Uh, yeah, the issue is really, first, should we be a member? Second, should we be a member now? Should we enter into the organizations now? Shanghai Organization of Cooperation is uh, economic, political, and military organizations, or security organizations, how they call it. And they always exercise every year very large scale uh, military exercises. Uh, <clears throat> now the question is, what happens if we are member or not member? Uh, say, up to now we've been, uh, uh, we've been uh, an observer member why we should be a member, will it be any change from China and Russia from the two our large neighbors towards Mongolia, will it be any larger investments, what kind of investments it will be there, will this corridor talks uh, which is going on for the last five, six years, will it be finally implemented, we don't know yet. So until we have a full confirmation uh, that we, what is, what is, what if it is, what is it if we become member? So we want to know it, probably we, we would like to know it more before. Um, in particular for development of the country, two neighbors play important role, uh, but uh, we don't see substantial investment, uh, investment from, for example, uh, Russia. We have a problem with railway. We have just one line railway that has uh, no electrification. It is just on diesel. And we have a big problem with the capacity of the railway. When it will be changing? Because it's owned by two governments. And the, the uh, changes, the reform is becoming very slow. So until we know all this, I think it is very early to say that now we should be immediately a member. Would it really resolve Mongolia's economic problems to join the SCO? Or is it um, just too fast of a decision to make for now? Well, that's the issue. We don't see preliminary commitment and I think on the economic development. But I think even we say 
now because president is going to meet two other presidents of two labor countries in Shanghai, in Qingdao mm -hmm. in a week from now. So will they, will they discuss about that part? We don't know yet. And we, I think until we know what exactly will happen if we are a member, it is not the way, I, I, I don't expect the president is coming and saying that we will be a member. But there will be certain conversations toward to that directions uh, which is more than, than the, uh, the observer status we have today. What would we lose if we do not join the SCO? Nothing much, because we have been a member up to now, and uh, we should uh, make a one note that three major members of Shanghai, one of the fund, uh, three major founder members, Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, uh, China, China, all are run by uh, one individual or one political party for quite some time. At times it is more than in case of Kazakhstan 28 years. Huh? So, but yet Mongolia is run in different ways. It's a parliamentarian system. We keep changing our government every four years, even at times every two years. So whatever make decision, they make decisions, it can be challenged back. So I think with this note, our president will have on step towards that issue. Do you, do you think that the um, decision that is going to be um, taken by the president and the parliament in June, it's going to take place in a closed session of the parliament? Uh, we had already a closed session of the parliament on the issue. Uh, but yet this issue is, uh, should be open because it, ha it will to do a lot with everybody, every Mongolian. Because as a democratic country, we should know more about exactly what the government is doing towards that direction. Um, so now we, we will raise an issue of uh, what will happen to the issue of the third neighbor, for example, right? That policy we was keeping for quite some time. And, uh, Will this our mega project, so called, will continue after that? How fast? We don't know yet. All these issues uh, bring us to demand the government to discuss that open. Thank you. Let's start the next topic. It is the Constitutional Court, and um, should it still be in effect in Mongolia? Um, the Constitutional Court, as you know, was founded in 1992 to enforce the constitutional law and legislation. It is a decision-making authority that annuls laws that are violating the Constitution. So, um, today the issue is um, four out of nine members of the Constitutional Court are um, going to have um, expiration of term of office soon. Many nominations were proposed during this uh, parliamentary session of last week, and in just three days, the parliament and the president nominated four individuals for, for parliamentary members um, without revealing in particular to the public their full biographies or qualifications. Um, why? Uh, could you please tell us um, what you think about the nominees and what is happening? Um, okay. Um, what happens is uh, four members are anyway approved by the parliament. These four members are not based on merit according to the lawyers who are signing for petition against their nominations in the country. Now, question is, are they based on their merit or not? It's, of course, separate questions, which according to the lawyers, it is not. But many high-ranking public officers' nominations are happening in this way, speaking about the merit-based nomination, which is not happening in this country. And, uh, if you look at these candidates, three who were proposed by the president, 
were former mostly working with the Democratic Party. The other one, Mrs. Salongo, used to work for all these years with all prime ministers. She used to work in the cabinet of uh, cabinet secretariat of the country. She is a very knowledgeable person of all whatever happened in this country. So some say that constitutional court nominations are following the same pattern of negotiations in between two political parties who are ruling the country, who have been ruling the country either together or separately. So the issue is, uh, are they based on their merit or not, still open? Uh, and now the, another issue is coming with uh, why these nominations are so important. Uh, because uh, now then it's an issue of the status of this constitutional, constitutional court. The constitutional court is, uh, uh, is established and, uh, and uh, is run by uh, Mongolian, the Mongolian constitutions in which we have a special provision that there is a court called constitutional court who will judge the issue whether any law in the country or any other things are violating the constitution or not. So in that sense, you feel like it's the highest decision maker in terms of constitutional violations or not. Uh, but in some countries, uh, they're not necessarily they have constitutional court, but instead the higher high court, Supreme Court of the country, are also solving the issues of uh, related to the constitution or related to other criminal and other cases. So now people are raising the issue as well, whether we need or that that constitutional court. Mm -hmm. So is is the constitutional court necessary? Well, exactly. That's the uh, that's the conversation happening in the country. If we keep nominating people uh, in that way, as it is, as is criticized by the other lawyers, and uh, so we'll see. People have big questions on the way, on the speed of the, uh, the processing of these nominations very fast and still in, in, in the line of negotiations between president, presidency power and the parliament power who is now dominated by People's Party. Basically, it's a negotiation of two political parties. There, there is a group of lawyers who are signing a petition to revoke the decision of the parliament and the president. Um, would they? Would it change anything if they uh, if they sign this petition and present it to to the parliament? I don't think it is any changes happening now, and it is too late. But only bigger concern is coming with this so much lawyers coming and signing and uh, bringing petition against these nominations. If it is the, this case, it will be the first incident in the country against these high-ranking decisions, high-ranking position decisions by the parliament. But uh, the issue is brewing, have been brewing in the society for quite some time, in particular the uh, court system People have big hesitation about justice system in the country, which is serving mostly the government. We in kind of a lost, uh, kind of a lost this balance between two, three powers, and also these three powers. Since we have lost the balance, I mean, a parliament member now is becoming a government member in the country. Every parliament member potentially wants to be a cabinet minister. Mm -hmm. As a result, we keep changing the government every maybe 24, 22 months. Um, that creates instability in Mongolian governance and it creates incompetence because we keep changing ministers, ministers change other political officials, no, all, I mean all the public officials in the, in the ministry, including even the cleaners in some cases. That brings a uh, very bad, uh, not good condition, not inducing conditions for, for businesses because you, you go to the ministry, people are changing. So uh, 
if that because this petition, these positions will be changed, then there will be many other petitions against many nominations in the country. There, there is a um, member of the Constitutional Court who has served there for 26 years. Um, is this um, is this experience any uh, useful to, uh, isn't it um, uh, going against what you, what you have just uh, said with regards to, um, with regards to officials hiding behind, um, hiding behind um, positions in the government? Yeah, this is a certain interest groups who are dominating in this sort of positions, nominations. Um, I mean, depending on which political party is in power, they suppose that not to change the public offices, yet they change because political parties are being financed by, uh, political parties being financed by the people who has money. And those parties is not the reporting on where they are, this money is coming from. Uh, I mean, the political parties financing the campaign, political election campaign financing are secret in this country. Because it's a secret, people don't know where they are getting this money. And it basically, the people who is donating money to the political parties are controlling the state. And through the state, they are also nominating on people. So people are becoming very pessimistic and skeptic about this kind of high-ranking nominations. Thank you. Um, let's now move to our third topic of the evening. Um, it's the Asia-Europe meeting that was organized by Mongolia in 2016. This was the 11th meeting. And um, last week, a financial report on expenditures related to the meeting was presented to by the National Audit Office and according to the Deputy General Auditor of Mongolia, Madame Ayumbilik, the office examined about 46 organizations, 28 legal entities or individuals, and as of today, 17 public officials were uh, are going to be held responsible for the misuse of 79.2 billion tukriks which is approximately $39.6 million. Um, they also issued bills of indictment and other, in, other um, uh, advices or recommendations that, that are going to be given to the government as well as a number of ministries. Um, would you please tell us can this money that that is in deficit, who is the 17 officials that are going to be held responsible? Um, why aren't why aren't their names revealed, and will they really be held responsible? That's a big question. But however, you know, you see, let's 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 look at back. All this happened in. 2016, then the, that year the government has changed it, and now the state auditor, which is nominated by new power, is going back to inspect what exactly happened around this ASEM. Uh, ASEM, it is political importance was very big for Mongolia, but because it's such a large event with about 60 or so state leaders, about two, three thousand delegations coming. The country had the largest possibly international event in our history. And they spent a lot of money. They also, we got the money from Korea, from China, from Japan, assistance to organize this event successfully. But the problem is this money, in particular, for example, assistance from Korea, Japan, is not clearly reported. And we don't, there is no, according to these uh, inspections, there is no proper document. Who received, what received, when received, is not clear. And this, I'm not sure that the 17 public high-ranking officials will be held responsible for that. Uh, today, they, we don't know the names, 
but we don't know all the, we know all the, the seven and a half million US dollars worth public money was embezzled according to this state auditing uh, report. But whether they will be responsible for, uh, hold responsible, will their name will be revealed, we don't know. Hopefully it will be so that we don't have again this sort of uh, this mismanagement of public money which is happening unfortunately all around at almost all stages of our Mongolian public uh, governance. And all this governance started from again we have talked about the financing of political parties and since that part is secret and the many other things happening really spending our money international assistance money, not clear. As a result, we have a more corruption. As a, as a result, we have a less quality of public management. Would the high-ranking public officials in 2016 that were um, organizing uh, the uh, Asia-Europe meeting, um, could they could they be held responsible now and can they be examined starting from the president or is it too late? No, it is not. Uh, that's why, you know, state, uh, state agency, state uh, or general auditing agency of the country uh, is, went, for the, went for that examination for these people and they, will, they are still continuing that uh, inspection I understand, not only ASEM and many other uh, mishandling of public management and I think it's normal trend and I, th I think the people should be kept responsible for any events happening before. Doesn't matter how many years ago it had happened. Uh, I, for example, you have mentioned about this uh, monuments, statutes, statues they have erected for this ASEM event. Yes. And they, but there is a one monument uh, which, uh, which cost about 600, 60, 600 almost 70 million US, to, uh, you, uh, Mongolian to Greeks called uh, the window to the sky. That monument, for example, is staying now and nobody knows who is responsible for this monument mm -hmm. to maintain, to keep an order in and around. It's a huge, large construction. And uh, we don't know still yet what happened to many buses, cars they have they bought for the delegations. Uh, according to some sources, the buses are how some of the buses are staying uh, parked in some places, but not clear in where they, this bus will go, in which balance these buses are. So uh, we we basically talk about. Um, uh, irresponsible spending public money, whether whether it is the bond proceeds or public assistance, property, this country is not running properly. I, I like you know, like many other state property, like Ulaanbaatar city property. Uh, and, uh, by the way, this Assam, uh, we have created a villa there, expensive villa where the state leaders were staying and all this revenues and expenses we want to see very comprehensive report which is not yet available publicly let's let's um, discuss more um, for example the ministries of finance and ministries of foreign affairs um, the minister uh, of foreign affairs at the time, Mr. Purusuren, he had estimated that ASEM events will cost around ten million dollars, but in the end, it totaled up to one hundred and ninety-seven point nine million U.S. dollars, and that is a huge miscalculation, isn't it? Yeah, Mr. Purusuren was saying that ASEM uh, will total cost will cost twenty billion, which is if that time say the rate was 2,000 to two to one dollar, it's around 10 million as you said, but actually this general auditing report says, uh, says that it is about 400. So really these big discrepancies, 
we chose two things. One is not clear calculation, huge differences, and why is that report comes like this, why estimation was like this, and what exactly happened with the remaining in general, what was the general plan, what kind of expenses were included into balance or not of particular organizations or if it is included at all. Uh, you see, it also shows, I think well, Mr. Professor will uh, himself to report what is the difference, why is that uh, such a difference. But in general, uh, we talk about the ethics of public offices. Here in the country, even they give oath to the flag of the country that they will serve properly this country, this state. But unfortunately, in the reality, there are many cases where they are not doing what they are promised under the earth, uh, under the oath, I mean. So, uh, in all this kind of work is coming from, again, the mismanagement, mismanagement and uh, misman public management based on not, uh, on the, uh, not public management uh, based on not the best talent selected. So altogether makes the government's more governance not uh, very good and the corruption index is high. Uh, as a result, the country is not moving as much as we were planning. Economic plans are not achieved in, in particular crisis time. And it, that means uh, the, the job unemployment issue is coming. And that's why we have one third of the country is still poor. And we have uh, almost three quarter of the whole population is living uh, with uh, not good sanitation houses. Do you believe that um, the Asia-Europe meeting in the long run is going to be beneficial to the Mongolian economy? Uh, well, in a way, with bigger picture, yes, because Mongolia is now known for many countries, to many public of many countries, otherwise we could not outreach. We have outreached, and now more and more people understand exactly where is the country, what are the problems, what kind of level of democracy we have, and I have no doubt it could play an important role for further economic cooperation with other nations, for development of tourism. So uh, I, have a not, uh, I have no doubt. Now, the only issue is now we have to clean the house after all this mismanagement of uh, public fund. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. Um, that is all for this edition of De Facto Review. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.